thanks uh, for the invite uh, to this conference. Um, I just want to get a gauge of the audience in this room, actually. Uh, how many of you have either travelled out to the emerging markets or travelled regularly to the emerging markets? Wow. Excellent. Okay, so the reason I ask is because uh, I'm really not here today as someone who knows everything about emerging markets. Many of my experiences will hopefully be uh, familiar to you, um, but at least if there are some new insights or if my experience is something that you can relate to, then uh, this presentation might well be useful. <laughs> okay, so uh, just looking at the agenda briefly, uh, I'm going to break it up into three parts, uh, tell you very briefly about my background. Stephen's done a grand job of that already. A little bit about Emerald, uh, the business that I work for. Um, and then going to talking a little bit about some of the data uh, some of the trends around uh, the business potential in emerging markets, but more specifically also then to uh, publishing uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a commercial outfit. Um, and then finally, the, the second half of that presentation, we'll just look at some of my personal experiences from a cultural, legal and political, the challenges in relation to those, um, and then also some hints and tips as to the kind of things that I've found as I've uh, spent my time out uh, in those markets. Um, as I said, not, not going to spend too much time on this. Um, I sit on the executive board at Emerald, uh, leading uh, Emerald's operations uh, in those areas, um, having spent 10 years in academic publishing. Um, you might note uh, there I, I studied international business and Japanese at the undergraduate level. Now, um, in hindsight, Japanese is probably the wrong language. Um, but uh, uh, I suppose living in Japan uh, was probably more compelling at that age. And uh, well, what does a 19-year-old know about uh, the future of the world economy anyway? So uh, moving on, a little bit about uh, Emerald. Uh, we're a global publisher. Um, our ethos has always been about linking research and practice. Um, we have a, a reasonable uh, network of 106,000 editors, authors, uh, and advisors, and uh, 5,000 customers globally. Our subject focus, as well as your specialism, really is in management, but uh, we also offer broad uh, subject specialisms in areas such as uh, education, uh, engineering, and health and social care, for example. And we have a global presence. Uh, we have customers in over 130 countries. Uh, we have for some time now established uh, a presence in many countries. We've got uh, representatives on the ground in 28 countries out of which we have eight established offices, and uh, uh, many of them are in the emerging markets that, we did, that was uh, part of the discussion today. Uh, so we have an office uh, in Beijing, an office in Delhi, um, an office in Sao Paulo, and an office in Johannesburg. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, and go into some data sets, uh, which I uh, particularly find interest interesting. Um, and this particular slide uh, I've used uh, for a little bit of time now because I do find it graphically interesting as to what it shows. Um, and this is actually taken from uh, World Bank and uh, PwC estimates uh, to 2050, tracking GDP growth or decline, in fact, uh, of uh, uh, emerging markets uh, but then versus those of the more developed uh, markets. So what you can see quite easily on that uh, graphic there is that uh, by 2050, it's uh, anticipated that uh, China, India, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Indonesia will uh, outstrip the growth of GDP and have a higher ranking than the more established economies of today. So uh, what you see there is a decline uh, with the likes of uh, US, Japan, Germany, and the UK over that period. Uh, so what's, uh, what's, what's, what's behind the rise of the emerging markets? It's, uh, it's actually the middle classes, uh, typically, uh, which comprise a consumer society and drive volume consumption that is behind the rise of the emerging markets. It's driving uh, consumption behaviour. And when you look at the sheer numbers of the middle classes in countries like China, India and Brazil, uh, they do make for a powerful uh, economic force. There are a number of uh, other interesting facts. I'm not going to talk to all of these. Uh, the slide deck is available on the Alps uh, website, so uh, you, can, you can have a look at these uh, at your own leisure afterwards if you wish. OK, so uh, moving closer to publishing, I suppose, uh, what I wanted to do was to share this slide. Of, I think it's a couple of years old now, but uh, this was a piece of research carried out by PCG 
in which they uh, surveyed a number of uh, librarians globally uh, to really determine where they felt library budgets were going to move to by 2014. We're actually in 2014 now, so uh, interesting to see if these uh, numbers have uh, been mapped out as they suggested. Um, from my perspective, uh, working at Emerald um, and talking to librarians and talking about their budgets, it feels like that probably is a true reflection, uh, where quite simply it uh, reflects the fact that uh, in the Asia Pacific and South America, library budgets uh, were shown to still uh, be on the increase, whereas in Europe and North America, uh, budgets were either stagnating or declining. Um, I don't know if that's the same experience that uh, many of you have uh, seen within your uh, particular markets. Um, I'm going to use this slide really as a link uh, between the data sets uh, that I've just talked about uh, with a specific example of uh, publishing trends here and then looking at the publishing considerations as we go forwards. Um, and this slide actually uses China as an example um, with regards to scholarly research output. Um, and what it shows here uh, is that uh, in the area of uh, engineering specifically, uh, Chinese uh, research scholarly output in that area has actually exceeded that of the US. Um, now, whereas the top graph uh, talks to quantity, um, you might well ask, well, OK, uh, quantity versus quality. Well, the bottom graph uh, represents an indication of uh, where quality output uh, from China is, is, is heading as well. Um, and it highlights uh, the Chinese uh, uh, output as a percentage of US citations. Um, and actually, at 80% in 2012, uh, I dare say that uh, at that growth and trajectory, that that will probably catch up to the US very soon as well. So uh, quantity as well as quality uh, as an output from the emerging markets using China as an example. I'm going to talk now uh, a little bit uh, about uh, publishing uh, in emerging markets. There are a number of uh, considerations uh, when operating publishing uh, in emerging markets. One of those considerations are standards and ethics. And I think uh, ethical uh, decision making can be quite uh, situational and context specific uh, in these markets. Um, sort of institutional norms and the way of ways of working practices can be quite different to the Western world and, and the way that we would uh, determine standards and ethics to be. And I think as international publishers, uh, it is down to us to actually go out there and promote international standards and ethics. That's not uh, an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, there are uh, obstacles that you will come across in that respect, but uh, I think it is our duty to go out there. And one of the ways we can do that is really by offering clear guidelines and expectations to meeting those kind of standards, such as copyright issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thinking about quality uh, in as far as uh, publishing and emerging markets, um, I think what you'll find, uh, you can tell me afterwards, uh, but uh, the emerging markets definitely pay a lot of attention to um, impact factors. ISI uh, is an important metric uh, that they strive for. Um, and uh, these metrics are highly valued. Um, the approach that we need to take as publishers, I suppose, from my experiences going out there, understanding that actually um, the world is uh, more than just ISI. Um, you know, there are other impact, other factors, other other elements that we can take to the board, other alt metrics that we can take, and uh, really engaging with them in that conversation is something that uh, can uh, differentiate you from uh, from from in entering those markets. Um, looking at uh, funding, then. Um, what I would say to this is, I suppose, um, the most common reason given um, by uh, researchers uh, for publishing is the idea of disseminating uh, research output as widely as possible, whereas a uh, slightly cynical view, but I suppose what they're really driven by is where the funding exists. And uh, uh, on that basis, we, uh, we can also work with them to really help them realize the full potential. That poses a set of different challenges uh, from a financial perspective, but also in consideration of the kind of business models that you might deploy, uh, thinking about where the funding policies are uh, and really honing in on uh, uh, that research output so that we're meeting their needs, but also meeting a need for wider uh, global dissemination of that output. 
And of course, um, doing all of the things that uh, I've just mentioned there uh, creates opportunities for publishers. Um, what we need to be mindful of is the need to be uh, a f flexible in our approach in understanding how we can help institutions and associations realize global visibility. Um, and what we can't do is we can't underestimate uh, the value of true relationship development uh, in gaining success in these emerging markets. So now that I've uh, looked at some of the publishing uh, trends in emerging markets, I'd like to share some of my personal experiences about uh, doing business in these uh, markets. I've taken this from the perspective of looking at them as challenges. So uh, the first challenge being cultural. Um, and uh, relationships is uh, the first point on the, agenda, uh, on the agenda there for that particular uh, challenge. Um, I think you've got to make uh, a real uh, effort to invest time in the relationships. I think uh, anything other than that uh, comes across as fickle and will be recognised as such. Um, I recall uh, spending uh, three hours uh, uh, in, a, in a banquet at the Inner Mongolia border uh, with a number of customers. Long banquets are quite the norm if you've been out there. Uh, minus 30 degree temperatures in an outdoor restaurant. Um, I think I invested my time in that particular relationship. Um, with regards to relationship also, there's uh, elements of etiquette and respect uh, that you need to take into consideration. And simple things such as understanding seating hierarchies. Um, traditionally, uh, attending meetings in these uh, nations, there's some sort of uh, uh, hierarchy, hierarchical orders to where you sit. Um, and that might not be the same as what you would assume uh, in uh, a normal Western meeting. Um, thinking about local flexibility, um, the point I'd pull out here is you, you have to be willing to assume and adjust to different ways of doing things, and one of those is punctuality. Um, you can't really have the same expectations uh, to timekeeping as you would uh, when you're attending Western meetings, so you should yourself uh, aim to uh, be there on time or a little bit early, but uh, you might not necessarily expect to find uh, uh, the clients or the customers waiting there on the other end. In fact, maybe 10 to 15, 20 minutes later even uh, is quite uh, normal practice. Um, and as far as language is concerned, uh, whilst I said I probably chose the wrong language in Japanese, however, um, having lived out in Japan and understood uh, the Eastern culture was a great way of transferring that to uh, these uh, particular markets, particularly those in the East, um, but actually making some kind of effort to at least say some words actually does go a long way in creating and uh, helping nurturing uh, those relationships. So that was the uh, cultural challenge. Um, wanted to talk a little bit now about legal challenges, and I've taken this from the perspective of market entry. Um, market entry is from the point of, not early market entry, but actually something a bit more mature, um, to the point that if you are at a point of uh, creating a legal entity or a legal presence, um, that's where I was going to take it from. And uh, my my uh, experience of this is, you know, so many things to consider with particular regards to local laws uh, and the business partners that you may choose. Um, from my personal experience, um, I went about setting up uh, a number of uh, the legal entities uh, in, uh, for Emerald in these, uh, in these markets. And uh, with best intentions, I set about uh, uh, hiring uh, you know, probably uh, top four firms to, uh, to deploy this uh, strategy. Um, with the best intentions that they would have uh, the right level of impact, uh, they would make the right impression. Uh, but actually, what I found is that uh, even though they were based in those markets, having local offices there, because they are an international firm, they actually adopted more of an international mindset and actually missed some of the local nuances, uh, missing out some of the local cultural understanding. That actually would have helped the process along a lot smoother particularly working with those that are affected on the ground already if you've got a team already established and migrating them to uh, a legal presence uh, in the sense of a, a fully formed subsidiary or a, a fully formed legal entity. Um, so from my experience, I think, uh, uh, you know, working with someone in the middle uh, is probably the best approach. Uh, those companies that would have definitely an international knowledge and understanding, but then also really have a good local uh, knowledge and experience. Uh, the next challenge uh, I would highlight is uh, the political challenge. Um, a lot of these markets, uh, you know, 
can be quite volatile, just in the nature of the pace of growth uh, dictates that uh, these uh, markets will uh, suffer some level of volatility. Um, and you've really got to be mindful of that. And uh, one of the ways uh, that you can uh, work to those is to really work in broadening your networks and uh, relationships at the government and institutional level. Um, because some of those people that you're working with one day might not be there the next, unfortunately. Um, so really broadening those networks. Um, another aspect of working in these emerging markets as an approach you can take is a lobbying strategy. Um, it's quite acceptable um, where there's a, a bigger uh, political agenda. Uh, rather than be a lone voice, you can actually work with your competitors or other groups of associations that have a similar interest and lobby the government um, in, in, in respect of uh, those changes. Um, and uh, really, with regards to that, then, doing all those things, you can really go about building credibility and, sus uh, and sustaining integrity. I think the way that you go about that is, as uh, Anton said, is do your homework. Um, and, and, that, and that needs to be done ahead of time. There's a lot to be understood before you go into the markets. Um, you can't go in there naively, expect things to be in a certain way and uh, you have your perceptions quashed. Um, one of the ways you can achieve that is by putting the right people on the ground, and I think uh, there's a lot to be said about finding the right people with a good local understanding, but with a global awareness so that they can work in a global organisation. Um, and importantly, I think it's, it's right that you look to maintain your core values. Don't forget uh, where you are uh, as an international business based in a Western Western country going out to new markets that might not be familiar. Maintaining your core values allows you to maintain integrity, and I think that's uh, important. Um, but the actual uh, value of nurturing relationships, again, as I said, uh, it, it can't be underestimated, and that's both at an institutional and government level. And in fact, in China, they have a phrase uh, called Guangxi, which is all about nurturing those relationships. Um, and they put a lot of uh, uh, store on that. And a final slide, and this is just uh, uh, an infographic uh, that I found uh, uh, recently uh, by an artist called uh, Yang Liu, um, who actually cleverly manages to sort of uh, uh, translate some of the differences between the West and the East. Um, here for your amusement, I found them interesting. <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope you do too. Okay, that was the end of my presentation. I've probably rattled through that uh, quicker than you had uh, anticipated, so I'm happy to take questions. Any questions? I put a yes, Stephen. I keep forgetting I've got a mic. Um, I think the point you made in terms of some of the legal financial human mm. resources challenges. I think uh, on a lot of occasions we would operate individually as organizations when we're moving into new markets. Mm. And I just wonder to what extent Emerald has partnered with um, other UK organizations or organizations expanding into those territories mm. to share that information mm. um, when it might not have been available from some local sources. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, speaking to Anton uh, prior to this, I mean, uh, as there are different stages of market entry, I think there are different uh, approaches that you can take. I think finding out experiences of those who have already entered the markets before you is always particularly useful. But then uh, I was talking to Anton how we used UKTI um, when we were looking at market entry to different uh, markets other than the emerging markets as we've uh, talked to today. Um, and uh, we did find that particularly useful. It gave us a foot in. Uh, talking to other uh, publishers, you know, um, those that have already been longer established um, for different aspects. I mean, some have been longer established on the publishing function. Some of them have been longer established on the, uh, you know, on the sales territory, uh, market export entry uh, focus. So absolutely valuable and uh, well, we do the same. <laughs> Sorry, I have a se second question was related mm. to, and again, from the hands that went up earlier around the room, there's a lot of staff and organizations traveling to more developing parts of the world, mm. how can you guarantee that they're representing your organization effectively in, in, in the right way? Staff from here going out? Yes. Or? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I suppose from the perspective of defining the strategy of the approach that you want to uh, determine as far as the objectives for the particular market entry, um, 
going out there with best interest and I think that's the part where I was talked about doing your homework because um, if you go out there blindly uh, there are so many things that can take you down the wrong path uh, can mislead you or misguide you um, it's very hard to see the bigger picture if you're just going in uh, at a single point in time I think uh, going back regularly uh, taking a different perspective of things taking guidance as to which way to look at but actually Working with um, you know uh, a respectable uh, person on the ground that you can uh, trust their judgment and value uh, their judgment uh, goes a long way in uh, guiding that process. Tim, you had a question. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Thank you. Um, Emerald, I've obviously um, made a conscious decision to put people on the ground mm. that are your own people and officers mm. on the ground in different countries, and I can see why. You've done that. Um, not every publisher is has got enough product mm. to make that a worthwhile thing to do, and we have to work through local um, people. Yes. And I was just wondering whether you could just talk about the, the sort of the challenges of of that, um, and and how you know any advice for managing those sorts of relationships where you're having to work through a local, yeah. either an agent or a reseller. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always been a, an interesting challenge uh, working with the local agents, really, because they're not just taking on your own product, they've got other products to uh, to manage. Um, and, you know, I think finding the right partner, and uh, again, that's about your network, and so establishing a network that can uh, guide you to the right people, because uh, a number of agents that you could go to... Um, I suppose keeping um, a good relationship with them, visiting them regularly, as, and, and you know, treating them as if they were your employees, in the sense of uh, having that closeness and understanding of the market, um, not relying on them to hold the knowledge, making sure that they are sharing the knowledge with you, um, so that uh, you know, as part of a, uh, a strategy of, uh, like I said, different stage of market entry. If you were working with agents, you may well one day wish to graduate to a more of a local presence yourself. Uh, would allow you to do that, um, and you can you can coexist uh, together as well. We have m uh, many instances where we've got a local presence with our own people, but we also work with local agents in those territories. Sometimes, just because uh, the geographical uh, disparity of uh, markets like Indonesia, uh, Philippines, etc., uh, are more than what uh, one or two, or three, four people of your own can handle. Um, uh, so, you know, keeping a very good relationship with those and uh, test them, uh, you know, uh, really uh, stretch them as well because, uh, you know, complacency uh, isn't always what you want in these fast-growing markets. Thanks. Uh, could you share your experiences in India, uh, especially uh, in terms of the change from being viewed as a low-cost outsourcing hub? to a generator and consumer of content of scholarly work? Yeah, that's been a, an interesting, uh, you know, I've, I've been traveling out to India for the last uh, 10, 12 years, and I've seen that change happen in front of me in the way that uh, um, very much uh, viewed as a, a service economy um, with, with, as I said, uh, uh, high volume outputs of services to uh, an industry that actually that is uh, more strongly focused on um, if we're talking publishing scholarly output but uh, with, with, with challenges that we've seen there uh, with regards to um, government funding and when I, when I talked to political volatility I had the Indian flag there really because out of those emerging markets it's probably the one area that I found to have the most uh, volatility hopefully now uh, with the new president uh, there is going to be a, an amount of stability and some good measures uh, particularly focusing on education uh, but uh, you know where you think you're making some level of traction, um, the next year you can just find you've you, you've been set back again. Um, uh, you know, part of the election process last year meant that they uh, took away the funding from education to fund the particle political uh, party political broadcast. So uh, uh, that is in itself a challenge. Um, but uh, the trajectory is right. Um, as I said, all the ingredients are right uh, for that. Um, a number of uh, high-ranking institutions in India. I think uh, I, I was recently out at uh, an Indian management conclave uh, with a, a gathering of deans and professors from uh, the top schools in India. And what they are trying to do is really trying to 
get on that international stage by talking to international standards, um, accreditation being one of them. And uh, um, whilst uh, last year, the two years ago, there were only two schools with AACSB accreditation, actually now there's 36 in the pipeline uh, and that will happen very quickly. Um, and with that, that will uh, absolutely drive uh, that economy forward. A related question. Yes. Uh, what about Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri yeah. Lanka, which is yeah, absolutely. again yeah. politically volatile? Yeah, they are also politically volatile. Um, however, they uh, they also have uh, funding. Uh, some of that is uh, uh, World Bank funding that they have for uh, other 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 bodies such as INASP, um, which creates the impetus for. Uh, research funding um, and we've worked in partnership with those uh, and we have actually done deals uh, directly with institutions in Pakistan with the higher education committee uh, with UGC in Bangladesh um, and what they've done is really uh, fostered a need to understand okay what is it that they need as a as a core collection and really building on that and uh, starting small I suppose uh, but they are uh, gaining momentum in that regard thank you Uh, Mark Harden from Mosaic uh, Recruitment. Um, I, I just ask you or, or any of the panel members ab about this. Um, I'm a huge fan of localness in sales and cultural sensitivity and, and those good things. But also, I'd be interested in your comments on the uh, occasional advantages of being kind of outside of the local culture in sales situations, which allows you to disengage from local politics, to avoid... Uh, perhaps expectations of, well, let's say, bribery and things like that, um, and also to say things that couldn't be said. And certainly I've been in situations where my local agent can't say something to a prospect w where I can as the visitor. Um, do you, any of you have kind of experience of that and an interest in the, in the creative power of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'll let the others talk as well to it, but uh, um, I think uh, when I was referring to uh, international standards and ethics, I think... Uh, I didn't mention it, but certainly uh, uh, bribery, we have a bribery act that we, we must adhere to, and that's certainly something that uh, uh, we must uh, educate uh, these markets that just have a different way of working. It's not necessarily bribery as such, but uh, uh, there's a, um, you know, a culture of gift giving which could be construed as bribery, but uh, uh, varying degrees of that. We need to be uh, mindful of how we approach that. We can actually uh, stipulate that these are things that we just will not do or engage in. And they can accept that uh, because they can understand that you're coming from a different uh, business background, different culture. Um, but then there's also the element of, uh, as, as I suggested there, Mark, about being direct and indirect. And in many of these uh, uh, cultures, um, the approach is to take a slightly indirect uh, route. And I suppose I refer, I refer to the bottom right uh, graphic there which uh, talks about dealing with problems we'll probably walk straight through it whereas uh, uh, the uh, cultures in these markets might just skirt around it but get to the uh, problem at the end at some point uh, different ways of working is uh, the reference No, I mean, totally agree with everything that's been said. Um, what I would say with regard to sort of standing outside of the local, well, just, take, sorry, take one step back. Um, this idea of sort of, you know, understanding local culture is, is absolutely of paramount importance, whether you're setting up a business abroad or whether you're doing business in another country. Um, but just taking up the point on things like accreditation, I'm dealing with a couple of companies in Hertfordshire who actually um, do accreditation, and they're doing that in various countries throughout the world. Um, they are outside of the local um, partner, if you like, or in fact the local country, because they're doing it um, from a UK point of view. And, and I have to say, and this isn't just me, by the way, waving the, the Team GB flag, there is, uh, I guess, an increasing view that in certain countries we are doing things in, in, in the proper way. And, and accreditation is, is, is one of those things. I think a lot of companies now uh, in different countries are looking for the, the UK version of, you know, whatever may or may not be available locally. So I think we do have some advantages there. Um, personally, I've always been pretty straight talking, uh, but there are definite um, areas of etiquette to be um, careful of in certain of the countries that we've mentioned here anyway. And for me, I've always taken a view that, you know, business is about people. 
you're doing business with people, you're talking to people, um, and other than doing something really damn stupid, which I doubt if very many people here in this room would do, I think actually if you're dealing in uh, Brighton and you've got clients there in, in Belgium or, or Birmingham or Burma, maybe very, very similar from the point of view of um, common sense is what I'm going to refer to it as. Thanks, Mark. One of the things I would add, I think one of the, the strongest statements was in terms of setting standards and living by those standards when you operate overseas. Um, for our own organisation, diversity is key, diversity at all levels within the chemical sciences. When we're operating in other parts of the world where diversity in uh, gender, for example, um, is not in, held in the same regard, we have to lead by example. Um, and the same is true when sort of gift giving um, and, and, and bribery. I've been in, in situations in India, for example, when a, a, a professor a, a adopting a product or making a buying decision, um, the comment may be, what's in it for me? And whereas as a, as, as a UK or US or European organisation, you absolutely know the position that you need to leave if you're using an agent, I think it's absolutely appropriate that you encourage your agents to work to those standards as well, um, and that you don't give in to some of the, the requests and some of the, the, the local territories. The UK legislation around bribery is, is one of the toughest in the world, and there are some significant penalties in place for uh, managers or directors of organisations um, if you haven't put sufficient uh, standards and guidelines and principles in place. Um, so it's, it's the management of an organisation, it's absolutely key that they ensure that members of their team travelling from Europe or the United States into eastern regions or, or other bricks or mint regions or staff that they employ in those local regions also adhere to some of the, to the bribery legislation. So great question Mark, thanks. Any other questions for Sharik? If not, if we could show our appreciation, thank you. Thank you. Sure.